Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello, everybody. I'm Barbara L., a grateful member of Al-Anon. I, um, I'm so happy to be here. This has been wonderful. This, this serenity by the sea is absolutely incredible. Um, I've enjoyed it so much, and it's not even over yet. You know, the, the love and the, um, and the openness, I feel very welcome here. Um, you know, telling my story is not something that I do very often. And um, when I prepared to tell the story, I, I, I met with my sponsor, and we talked about it and went over it. And, uh, and I, I, I went back home, and I said, you know what? There's nothing that I just said that I want to say again. <laughs> so no telling what's going to happen today. Um, I've been in Al-Anon. I, you know, I really don't know how long. If you ask Angela, she may know. It's not something that I keep track of. It's just not that important to me. What's important to me is that it still works for me, and so I keep going as long as it works for me. I, um, I was born in Baton Rouge, grew up there. I'm the fourth daughter of five children. I have a younger brother. Um, my parents were around 38 whenever I was born. They're a little bit older for the early 60s. And, um, you know, in my house there were three older girls and, and, you know, I had, I had a lot of care. I, it was a lot of fun. There was chaos. There was craziness, you know, and, um, they paid me a lot of attention. I had, they had to take me out on dates with them. So, uh, so I can remember having my little ice cream cone sitting on the floorboard of a car in the back seat. Remember back then, you know, the floorboards, they were huge. And I'd just be so happy and they'd be up in the front seat chatting or whatever it was they were doing. And, um, and I just thought that was wonderful. Um, my sisters did my hair and they, they took me places with them. And, um, I am, uh, I'm one of, um, 56 first cousins on my mother's side. I'm probably about number 52. So I'm one of the younger ones. So big family. I remember growing up, you know, they'd play boo and poker on Saturdays. Um, we had a boat, and, you know, some family members had camps, and so we'd go boat riding. And I and, uh, remember going to my grandmother's house in Pankerville a good bit on Sundays. Um, uh, right about the time my, uh, my younger brother was born, my mom and dad were 52 then. Some things started to change when my mom came back from the hospital. She was too sick to take care of him, and my sisters had to take care of him. And it was like overnight, they had to take care of her and him. It was like overnight my world changed. You know, that that attention and, and that one-on-one that I was getting, it was not there. You know, they were teenagers. They had a mother to take care of. They had me, a four-year-old, to take care of, five-year-old, and an infant to take care of, you know. And, um, and I can remember... You know, just being so, just, man, what is the deal, you know? Um, <clears throat> my mom was in bed a lot. She stayed in bed for a, a long time, you know, while my sisters um, raised each other and raised me. Um, I, We had drinking in our house, you know, when they'd get together and play poker or play bourree or have family reunions, or we go riding in the boat. You know, there was some drinking, but I never saw anybody falling down drunk or no fights or anything. You know, it was, it was very, very... You know, I look back on it today, and I would say that it was not anything not anything out of the ordinary. I don't know that, that there was alcoholic drinking. Um, you know, some of that developed. There's some alcoholics in our family. Um... But there was something else that was going on at that time. Um, my mother had some heart problems, and she was seeing a cardiologist. And I can remember um, being in grade school very young, and I can remember the calls to the doctor, the calls to the pharmacy, um, you know, the the sweet talking the doctors and the pharmacists, the, the screaming and threatening um, the doctors and the pharmacists, um, 
you know, I can remember some, some really crazy, crazy stuff that my mom was doing during that time. Uh, I, I didn't know what was going on. What I knew was, as a child, was that I remember being a, about waist high to the toilet, being in the bathroom and standing by the toilet, my mother standing over that toilet with a bottle of pill, pills in her hand, and her saying, I need these pills for my heart to live. I need these pills to live. But my family doesn't want me to live out of a bottle of pills. And she opened them up, and she poured them down the toilet, and she flushed them. And I think that's when the fear started for me. I think that was that was the moment that the fear started for me and, and the need to control things. That really scared me. And it also made me look at her family differently. I looked at those people and said, they don't want her to take her heart medication? I didn't find out that's not what it was until I was 32 years old. I found out that it was Valium's. Um, after that, after that event, you know, there was just that usual seesaw up and down, you know. Um, my dad was, uh, strong and steady. Boy, if there ever was an Al-Anon. <laughs> he was strong and steady. Six foot two, 200 pounds, all shoulders and chest, so good looking, so much fun, so easy to be around, encouraging and loving. Um, you know, and and I remember specifically, you know, how he dealt with my mom and what he what he thought about her, what he what his attitude was toward her, and what it was was that he felt sorry for her. You know, I remember him patting her, saying, "Oh, poor bebe." You know, I remember him saying, "Oh, she can't learn. <laughs> she can't learn." <laughs> you know, because she would, you know, um. He had a lot to deal with, five kids. And, you know, it took me coming to Al-Anon and open AA meetings for me to have gratitude that my mother stayed there. She was there. And, you know, she cooked and she cleaned and she ironed. She passed out every afternoon for a good long time, and I'm so grateful that the house never caught on fire. My brother and I never got into anything. Um, But, you know, she was still there. And... um, my mother and I's relationship was, it was bad for a long time, a long time. Um, and I think where it really went wrong was when I was about, um, I, I was about 13, and she um, went into the hospital. They found out she had a malignant brain tumor. And, uh, you know, they, they marched us kids in there and uh, to tell her goodbye. And um, I knew she was going to have surgery the next day. Um, Went to school, got called to the office for my class at school. Went up to the office just shaking, just thinking, oh my God, they're going to tell me my mother's dead. Because she had told me that she was at a school fair when they announced over the loudspeaker that her father had died. And so I thought, that's what they were going to tell me. That wasn't it. It was something else. I don't know what it was. I don't even know what it was. But it was nothing. And I remember walking home from school that day, and, you know, it wasn't anything conscious. But I decided that if I didn't love her, it wouldn't hurt. That her ups and downs, and, you know, this was like the third time she had died. You know, the first time was in childbirth with my brother. And then, you know, I said, you know, I'm just, you know, her ups and downs are too much. And I think on some level I understood I understood what her addiction, that it was progressing and what it was leading to. Um. You know, I, I didn't know anything about alcoholism. Not a thing. Um, and I blamed her. I blamed her a lot. Um, and our relationship really deteriorated. Uh, it, like, what relationships with 13-year-olds don't deteriorate? <laughs> Add that to the mix, you know. Add alcoholism to the mix, and what have you got? Um, but, uh, you know, teenager growing up and... And, um, you know, my parents, by the time I was a teenager, oh, they'd already done it and they were tired and they, <laughs> they, um, you know, they, they had kind of settled down. Um, my mom had been in the hospital a few times and I'll talk about that because I didn't know what was going on. I'll talk about that later. But, um, you know, a teenager and uh, my sisters were starting to date and get married and, um, oh, they were having fun. They were going out to bars. And, and the guys that they married, man, they were fun. Um, 
I could see them dabbling in, in drinks and, and drugs. I knew that was going on being a teenager, and I wanted to be cool like them. You know, so in, in high school, I sought out. I sought out that stuff. You know, I started seeking that out. And um, I, um, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. It was, um, it was late in high school, my high school years, um, probably, a, probably toward the end of my senior year, and I'd gone to a church fair, and I'd met this guy there, and boy, you talk about fun. I could see he was high as a kite, drunk as Cooter Brown, and he looked fun, and he was fun. Um, so I started talking to him, and uh, he started coming over, and we, we, oh, he'd tell me about his family, and I just couldn't believe it. They had six kids. They could do anything they wanted. And there, was, there was nothing that they couldn't do. Um, and he started to tell me about his home life, and I started feeling sorry for him. Remember I told you about how my dad dealt with my mother, that pity, that feeling sorry for her. And, um, you know, it just seemed to me from what he told me that he hadn't been cared for. You know, they didn't care if he went to school, didn't care, you know, if, if he, if he did this or did that. And I just thought, man, he just needs somebody to give him opportunities and care about him. You know, somebody to take care of him. And, and, you know, I didn't understand that. I I thought, you know, if if I'm given any opportunities, I'm going to take them. I didn't understand that there were people that that didn't want that. I didn't understand that alcoholism was already there. I didn't understand that he didn't have choices. I didn't know anything about alcoholism. And I was, I was just the right person for it. You know, there was something in me that just felt so sorry for him, like he needed somebody to take care of him. Um, Something else that that had happened uh, in my childhood that I think really formed me was, uh, I can't remember, I was probably about, let me think about that. If my sister was 18, then, you know, I was probably in fourth grade, maybe fifth grade. And uh, one night I woke up, and my older sister, that was 18, uh, she had her suitcase packed by the door. It was in the middle of the night, and... uh, she said, what are you doing up? I said, I, I want something to drink. She got me some water. Uh, she hugged me and kissed me. And she told me goodbye, not good night. And she put me back in my bed, covered me up, kissed me again, told me she loved me. And the next morning I woke up to my mother and father crying. She had run away. Uh, she had run away with the guy that she was dating that my family didn't approve of. And uh, I felt very responsible for that. I felt like... That was my fault in some way. She came back, and um, my mother said, "Mm -mm, that's what you wanted, that's what you got. You're not coming back here. So she stayed with him. Um, After that, my mom and dad would occasionally go and pick her up in the middle of the night. Um, And uh, she'd be crying. Sometimes she'd have a blanket over her. Sometimes she'd have a blanket over her, her face. Um, and uh, and they'd bring her home or bring her to my sister's house. But, um, you know, I, and I didn't know what was going on. All I knew was that they hated that man that she was married to. And she kept going back to him, so I could see she loved him. And again, I felt sorry for him. I didn't know what was going on. What was going on that was that he was beating her up. Um, very, very abusive person. And um, she stayed with that man for a long time. They moved away, and she actually never moved back. But that formed me, too, because what I heard from that was, you made that choice, you can't come back. There is no safe haven for you. I also heard that your value system, or our value system, our family's value system, is one where... You don't quit and you don't leave. You stay, no matter what. I got that from my father, and I got that message from that, from that incident. So anyway, let's get back to this this exciting guy. Very fun, very very dangerous. You know, I have a risk-taking personality, but 
I'm not going to go too far. Somebody's going to have to, I'm going to have to make sure it's safe. They're going to have to do it first. <laughs> I'll jump with you, but I'm not jumping by myself. <laughs> um, very exciting. And, and, you know, we kept dating. We ended up getting married. And, um, you know, I dated some different guys. We break up and get back together. I, I dated some different people in between, but, you know, they all seemed boring. The guys that I went to high school with that went on to college, you know, the one that's a cancer researcher, the one that has his own engineering firm, those guys were boring. <laughs> um, I wanted the one that was fun and exciting, um, and that he was. Uh, we ended up getting married, and, and you know, when I married him, I wanted to change him. I wanted him to change. You know, and I thought, you know, hey, you know, if I give him the opportunity to go to school and, you know, so after I got my job and started working, I was like, you know, you can go to, and he'd always said he wanted to do that and, and was going to do that, but that never materialized. And a job never materialized either. So I was basically supporting him and me. Um, you know, I, I, his drinking and drugging got continually worse. And it got scary too. What... um what I didn't understand, but I knew at some level, was that his disease was progressing toward death. And it was scary to me. Well, I wanted out. So I told him, I said, you know, I, I want out of this. You know, I, I, I don't want to do this anymore. He said, well, I'll go and I'll get a job. Okay. Um, but I still wanted out. And um, one day he came looking for me with a shotgun after I told him that I, I wanted to get a divorce. And he found me. Um, you know, I was pretty young then, and, and I, did, I, I wasn't scared. I really wasn't. Not then. I didn't know anything. I didn't understand alcoholism, addiction. I, I, I wasn't scared. I just brought him. And by that point, I was to the point where I wanted out whatever it took. And if it took death... That was okay with me. I just wanted out. He was headed toward a bottom that I didn't, I didn't want to go there. And I thought his bottom would be his death. I brought him to a friend who was in the program, who's in AA. This was a guy that had lived by us, um, and I knew that he went to Alcoholics Anonymous. And so I brought him there. Talk about God doing for us what we can't do for ourselves. He, um, he suggested I bring him to the hospital, and I did. And they uh, they admitted him in the hospital. And, um, you know, by that point, I was just done. I wouldn't even sign the papers for him to go in. You know, I said, I'm, mm -mm, I'm done. I'm finished. He went into treatment, and I went home. Had that behind me. I felt like I had alcoholism behind me. He started calling me from treatment, and I could tell that there were some things that were different. He did seem different. We started talking again. I went to one of the family meetings, and I can remember his counselor from the um, treatment center asking me, what do you see in this person? What is it that you, what is it that you like about? What, why do you want to be with this person? And the only thing that I could think of was that I felt sorry for him. That was it. And, you know, I know today that pity is no basis for a relationship. But I didn't know that then, and I didn't know anything about alcoholism. Somebody from the treatment center called me, the sweetest sounding voice. It was so sweet. And invited me to an alcohol, I mean, an Al-Anon meeting. And um, I thought, I don't need an Al-Anon meeting, you know, what is that about? So she told me you know, it's, for, it's for people who have family and friends of alcoholics, and um, and you might you know you might find some relief there, you might find um, you might find some help there. I thought, what do I need help for? But I thought, you know, I'm paying for this treatment center, this 30 day inpatient in, inpatient treatment center. I'm, I'm going to go see what it is I'm paying for. So I went to this Al Anon meeting, and. People were saying things. They were putting words to things that I felt but just didn't know how to describe. You know, living with that active alcoholism, you know, that that insanity and, and, you know, I would, the minute I'd get into reality, you know, things would just go haywire. Oh, um, and I was so beat down. 
I was keeping secrets. Um, I had isolated myself from family and friends. Anything that was healthy, anything that was good for me, I'd let that go. You know, I'd started working. I'd graduated from college and started working. I'd started building my career. And I wanted to climb the ladder. That's what I was about. I wanted to climb the ladder. And um, but in Al-Anon, I, I didn't have to keep those secrets anymore. Um, so I started going to Al-Anon. I went for a little while, and then they started talking about looking at yourself. I left. <laughs> I left real fast. I was like, uh-uh. You know, I was so beat down. My self-esteem was nothing. You know, on the outside, I was confident, and I was, I was moving. I was moving up. But on the inside, I was slowly getting worse as the alcoholism progressed. Um, so I left. About ended up getting back together. Um, with a man I'll call my ex-husband. Um, about three months after that, he was like, here's the al schedule. <laughs> Please go back. And I went back. And this time it was different because I went back with an open mind. Because when I went to Al-Anon that first time, you know, I got a little bit of relief. But when they started talking about looking at yourself, mm-mm, I didn't want any part of that. I felt so bad about myself. I thought it was about just looking at what's bad in you. That but I learned later that's not what it's about. That's what I thought it was. Um, that's hard to do, and I didn't want to do that. Um, so I went back with a with a different attitude, not a better attitude, a different attitude. I was open, but I didn't want to be there. I was angry and resentful for having to be there, and I was so scared. You know, I went there, they told me I didn't cause it, I couldn't control it, and I couldn't cure it, and that relieved me and scared me half to death because I knew that he was dying from it. And I had a value system that said, you don't let go. So I was stuck. Didn't feel like I could tell my family because I didn't want to be told what my sister was told. That's what you wanted. That's what you got. I can remember be, when I went back to al after being away for about three months, I can remember going to that meeting and somebody sitting in that meeting telling me, you know, I was crying, felt like there was just going to be this cloud over my head forever and that there was no way out of it that was going to be good for me or for him. And I can remember somebody saying, if you keep coming back, get a sponsor, work the steps, you will find help. I wanted to reach across there and bitch slap him. I thought, I thought, you think this stuff, you know, these, these, these steps and this stupid stuff. Oh, I had initials for the meetings. I called them um, MSPBR, Most Stupid People in Baton Rouge. <laughs> I thought... I looked around and thought, wow, this many people are dumb enough to get involved with an alcoholic? (laughs) You know, I just didn't know anything. I didn't know that people didn't choose to be alcoholics. You know, I didn't know anything about a disease, that it was a family disease. I didn't have a clue. Nobody ever talked, never talked about it, you know. It was definitely the elephant in the room because there were some alcoholics in my family by then. Raging alcoholics by then. All over. So I went back. Even though I resented it and had a bad attitude, my mind was still open because um, I was getting some relief. I was getting... I was letting stuff out. But trust people? Mm -mm. I didn't do that, you know. I, I didn't trust people. Um, I can remember being in one of those early meetings and a woman in that meeting, uh, I'd seen her in, in a lot of meetings and, and I said something in the meeting about the treatment center or whatever and, and she had said after I finished talking, she said, well, in Al-Anon we, we refrain from any discussion about treatment centers in the meetings. And, um, and you know, I, I was like, oh, okay, thanks. And I realized that she had... She had called me out in this meeting, so to speak. She didn't really. She was just 
doing what, she's, what, what we should do. She was very, very loving and respectful about it. But I felt like I had been loved and respected. And I hadn't felt that way in a long, long time. Long time. And I ended up asking that woman to be my sponsor. Uh, I thought, you know, if she can call me out in a meeting, so to speak, and my, you know, I was just so beat down and, and had no self-esteem, it didn't take anything to offend me or hurt me. And if she could do that and I wasn't offended or hurt, that's the one that I wanted, you know. Um, and so we started working the steps. And... You know, they talked about taking care of yourself. Up until that time, I had been so preoccupied, you know, and trying to stay ten steps ahead of the alcoholism and the effects of it, that I had, I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I wanted, didn't know what I thought, didn't know how I felt. You know, everything was wrapped up around, around trying to manage that. It was getting crazy. And for an hour, I would go in and it would stop. And I would hear something that was healthy, and I would hear people talk about situations that were way worse than mine. And they were happy when they came in. They were happy when they left. Wow, I wanted some of that. And, um, you know, although, and, you know, things were good and bad for me and my ex-husband. We had some good times, had some bad times. But that, that violence that took place when he came looking for me with that gun, that was always something that was just there. It was just there. It was now a possibility. And, and that, would ha- that would hang over my head for a long, long time. Um, you know, I didn't feel like I had choices and I loved going to those meetings and people talking about choices. I'm so thankful that when I got to a meeting that nobody said to me, you need to do this and you need to do that because I might be dead today if I had done those things. It wasn't time. It wasn't God's time. I can look back and see how, you know, how God, that wasn't his will for me to be with that person, how he gave me opportunities to get out of that when I could. But one thing that I've come to understand about my God, the God that, that I know, um, is that although he may not be obligated to get us out of what we get ourselves into, that he's still there. And if we'll just start to listen, he'll work it out. And that's what he did. Um, moved around with the company and moved up, moving up the corporate ladder. Um, my brother, my younger brother, he got into AA. He'd been in AA, I guess, about five years. Um, you know, I was I was around 30-ish, in my early 30s, and uh, his wife came to work for the same company, and so we were getting to take company trips together. How fun is that, to sit in the back of the bus with your sibling and make fun of the people that you work with? <laughs> it's fun. And our lives were beginning to, to intersect, you know. We were getting to know each other, and... Uh, and, and that was really great. We both lived up in North Louisiana, and uh, it was it was good. Um, you know, I didn't really care about what was going on, you know, with my marriage, you know, because my work was good, and my relationship with my brother was good, and I had some good recovery. And um, one Sunday night, sitting in my living room, I got a phone call from a friend of my brother's, and... Uh, and he told me that my brother had been killed in an auto accident. That really brought me to my knees. Um, because we weren't finished. We were not finished. You know, it hurt so bad that I couldn't, I couldn't hold it back. I could hold back the hurt of the, <clears throat> of the alcoholism and abuse or the threat of it with, you know, being busy and climbing the corporate ladder and, and being involved in the program, but I couldn't hold this back. 
It was really big. Um, and it brought me to my knees, you know. And, and I had been... I had been working the al program, getting to know the God of my understanding, who He is, and building a relationship with Him. And I'm so thankful because I wouldn't have made it through that time. I didn't, I'd never known until then what it was like to want something, anything, just to kill the pain. I thought about drinking every day. When I'd leave work and I wasn't busy anymore, on that ride home when my mind would quiet, I would think, I want something to stop this pain. Really good recovery there. Lots of good women in recovery in Monroe and in that area up in North Louisiana, West Monroe, Ruston area. Um, They helped me. And how I kill that pain, I didn't kill it. I turned it into something good. Um, You know, I was doing a lot of praying and meditating then. Um... And I'd I'd pray and and meditate sometimes for hours. I can remember being in my spare bedroom, just, you know, sitting there with God, you know. I'd learn from those women in Al-Anon there, when you want to have a relationship with somebody, you spend time with them. Not just an hour, a week. You spend time. You listen, you talk to them, you reveal your true self to them. The more honest you are with them, that's the people that, and that's who you bring the closest to you the people that you're honest with. And um, I can remember, you know, very clearly, you know, him telling me, I I want you to have a child. I want you to have a child. I thought, oh, you're thinking about the 19-year-old that just moved next door that got married. That ain't going to happen. You ain't thinking about me. (laughs) Never wanted children climbing that corporate ladder. Um, And I heard that message for a while. Um, You know, for some reason, I mentioned that to my husband one day. And he said, you know, I've been thinking the same thing. Um, So we ended up having a child. Uh, Oh, that was a wonderful time in my life. Uh, Being pregnant and having that little baby, oh, it was was awesome. It was incredible. I loved it. I knew that that's what God wanted for me. And I hadn't experienced that a whole lot in my life until then, having something that God wants for you. And it's not that it's easy, because it's not easy. It's just that it's so... I can't put it into words. Satisfying to the soul. My soul felt satisfied. And um, sometime after that, I could see that my husband's mental health was deteriorating. Um, it was deteriorating pretty bad. I was seeing some things that I'd never seen before. Um, and I still had that that relationship with a higher power. I still did that praying and meditating. I still went to meetings, still had a sponsor, still worked the steps. Um, and it was during that time that I felt that God was telling me to let go of that career, stop climbing the ladder, and um, come to the place that I've got for you. And it took me a year before I could say that out loud to anybody, including my sponsor, because I had been working on that career for a long time. You know, and I thought I was going to bring this man and this baby along with me. You know, and the whole time my ex-husband, you know, wasn't working. And, you know, I started to pretend like that was okay a long time ago, but it wasn't. And it hurt It hurt me, and it hurt him too. Um, so after about a year of thinking about that, and I had to get my own mind. I had to take that year to mourn, to grieve, and to let go. So I let let go of that, and I I moved back home, so to speak. I knew that I needed some support. Um, My ex-husband's mental health continued to deteriorate. I don't know if he was drinking or using. I honestly don't know. I didn't, I never tried to find out, but there was nothing that I could see or smell, or hear, you know, I knew that he spent a lot of time around people that drank and used, but I didn't, I couldn't tell that he was. Um, And by then, you know, I I knew that his program wasn't my program. You know, if he was going to meetings and having a sponsor, that's not my business. That's his. That's his program. Probably the first and only thing that I, I, I let go of in the early days you know, before I learned how to let go of other things. Um, 
Because I could see that he never really had anything that was his in his life. I wanted that to be his, and it was for a while. <clears throat> Move back down here, and things continue to get worse. Uh, he was disappearing, and that was kind of it. You know, there were a lot of things that happened, but the disappearing part, that uh, I, I felt that wasn't, that was just, that was too much. Um, so I told him that, you know, that, that needed to stop if we were going to stay together. And he said, we don't need to stay together. And I said, you know, what about counseling? No, no, that's not going to work. So, you know, we ended up separating. Um, and that was hard, you know. Um, our son was young, about four. But, you know, by then, I could see that the difference in the relationship between me and my son, even though he was a child, that was healthy. And, you know, what was with my ex-husband, I could see that it wasn't. There really wasn't anything there of a relationship, not much of one. It had gotten to the point where it was like parent-child, like I was a parent and he was a child. And that, you know, that's degrading and wrong for everybody. So we, we separated, and, and um, we were just about divorced. Um, it was right before the divorce was final. And um, he'd, taken, uh, he'd taken our son for a few hours and brought him back and said, you know, I want to talk to you. Um, I sat down at the table, and from behind me, he punched me in the head from behind me. And when he did, I, at first shock. And I reached for the phone, and I dialed 911, and uh, and he hit me again and, and got the phone. Um, I could see on the f- no, I could see on the phone that the light was on, and so I started screaming out, saying real loud what was going on and where I was, and and 911 was on the line because a police officer showed up at the back door. Um, during that time, you know, he struck me a few times and. Um, I picked up another phone. I think it was a it was a cell phone, and I uh, dialed 911 again. And I uh, took the phone from. He turned it off. He pulled a gun out of his his waistband and he put it to my chest, right by my heart. And uh, he said, "You're gonna die just like I am. I want you to suffer like I have." And in my mind, I thought when he said suffer, I thought he meant hurt my son because killing me to me that. I felt like I was going to heaven. No, you know, that was okay, but to me, make me suffer, hurt my kid. And I was hysterical. Um, my son had come in the room by that time, and I was trying to get him to walk out the front door. He was only four. I told him, I said, go to the front door. Unlock the front door. Walk out the front door. Go to the neighbor's house. You know, my, my ex-husband was telling him, no, don't do that. Um, policeman came to the door. I said, Tristan, go open the door, you know. And um, my ex-husband said, no. He eventually went and opened that door. And I'm here to tell you, when he opened that door, something came into the house. That police officer was standing at that door, but something came into that house. It was something good. Um, eventually, my, my son, you know, he let my son go, kept me there. Police officer, you know, I, I, he was so wonderful. He helped me. He told me what to do. He told me how to survive. I had a gun to my chest, and he was standing there at the door. He see, he didn't seem to have a gun. And he was standing there at that door telling me how to survive. And I was so grateful for that. Um, he got my son out, and uh, I said, I want you to call my niece to come and get my son. And he said, well, I don't have a phone. I need a phone. And so, you know, I told my ex-husband, give him the phone so he can call my niece. And... Um, so he did, and when he went to hand him the phone, the police officer made a mistake, and uh, the taser went off, and it didn't hit my ex-husband. So the police officer turned around and ran, slammed the door, and there I was. He told me, he said, he just signed your death warrant. And I thought, well, here it is. You know, in a few seconds, I'm going to be meeting my maker. And I said out loud, I said, God... Forgive me, forgive Daryl. And I said, you know, I said to my ex-husband, I said, I forgive you and I ask you to forgive me for anything that I've done to hurt you. And I can't, you know what I talked about when I said how something came into the house? I felt this peace come over me that was unbelievable. You know, to think, and what it was is that I knew that everything was going to be okay. 
I still thought I was going to die, but I, I knew that everything was going to be okay, and I knew that my son was going to be okay. And in the in the natural, you can't tell me that my son is going to be okay without me. <laughs> but I knew it, and you know I've tried to recapture that since then. That is so. That is such an incredible feeling to really know that you're going to be okay, and the people that you love are going to be okay. I think I knew to do that, you know, in part because of the program. You know, to ask for forgiveness and to give forgiveness. That's important. Some things transpired and he let me go. He ended up, you know, going to jail out of our lives forever. That night I called a friend in the program and her her husband, who's also in the program, came over um, to my neighbor's house where I was and... um, You know, it's just so incredible to be with people that aren't your blood, but you can put your life in their hands and know that they have no ulterior motive than to help you. That's that's a gift. That really is. You know, when I walked um, over to my neighbor's house where my son was, uh, the first thing that I told him was, "You did the right thing. You opened that door. You did the right thing." You know, I have a lot to say about forgiveness. I, I could, I could, I better check the time. You know, I have a whole lot to say about forgiveness. Um, for me, forgiveness equals freedom. I forgave him right then. But when you forgive somebody, that doesn't mean that you have a relationship with them. That doesn't mean that you let them back into your life. That doesn't mean that you don't go and testify to protect yourself and other people. It doesn't mean that what they did was okay. Or that what they did was your fault. What forgiveness is, is letting go of the hurt. I was so hurt. I couldn't believe that somebody that I had taken care of all those years would do that. And, And I couldn't understand how they could believe that it couldn't hurt a child to take his mother from him. I just didn't understand that, you know. And, um... Forgiveness, you know, I know that I've forgiven somebody when I've let go of the hurt, when I'm not carrying it around and thinking about it, when I'm not talking about it, you know. That's why, you know, sometimes talk and tell my story is kind of hard because, you know, I have forgiven. And, and, you know, I don't think about it, don't talk about it. But dredging up those things can be um, very hard uh, to go and testify. And, you know, I had written this letter that I wanted to say on the stand, and and I wanted the judge to know some things. And um, when I got on the stand, again, you know, that higher power, I'm listening, telling me what to do. I folded it up, and I said, I want to enter this into the register of the court. Anybody that wants to read it can read it. But I'm going to talk about my son, because he's the person that's most affected by this. You know, even though he was only four or so, Five, barely five. He's the person that's most affected by this, that has to deal. He doesn't have the tools. He doesn't have a program. He doesn't have the development that an adult has. You know, he has to deal with the shame and the guilt and the anger without anything. Not true. It's not that he doesn't have anything. He has a higher power, that same higher power that I knew was going to take care of him if I weren't there. I weren't there. He'd still have that same higher power. And what I decided to say out loud was what he experienced, what he was having to deal with, what he had to go through, you know, that he ended up getting held back a grade. You know, what, you know, how that, how that affected him. And, you know, I have forgiven, but when I see my son suffer today, from what I think are the results of that, of alcoholism, I can go back to not forgiving. And it still helps me today to do that same thing that I did, to say it out loud. God, forgive me, forgive them. You know, I don't have to go to their face and ask them to forgive me, and I don't have to tell them to their face that I forgive them. You know. Um, The officer, I wrote wrote a letter to the officer um, who came to the door to his boss telling him how good he was and how wonderful he was. Um, I imagine he probably read that report and knew what happened after he ran. 
And he might have felt bad about that. And I wanted to let him know and let other people know um, that he, that officer was the one that was there. He was the one facing the gun with me, not anybody else. And if he made a mistake, that there's a God that can work through anybody's mistake or nature or anything else and still make it work out. You know, that officer told me he had just come from church. Um, he actually received a, an award, and my son and I went to that award ceremony. It's an award that was usually given to officers um, after they've died in the line of duty. And at that award ceremony, when they started talking about what happened, um, I turned to my son. I had a little heart-shaped pen. And, uh, and I said, Tristan, this medal is for you, and, and uh, I want to tell you that you are my hero and that what you did was the right thing. And after that ceremony was over, um, I went to talk to the officer. I noticed that his wife wasn't there. And I went to talk to him. Um, and, uh, and I said, you know, I hope that you keep doing what you did that day because you're really good at it. And he put his arms around me and cried and cried and cried and cried. A grown man in front of all his peers. Um, you know, I tell you these things because they were part of my healing. And it's important to have things that are part of your healing. You know, we had so many things that were part of the hurt. And Al-Anon helped me too in that healing a lot, a whole lot. You know, um, nobody asked me questions. It's a long time before I was willing to, to say even a word about it. And that's what I needed. That's exactly what I needed. People just loved me and accepted me for where I was at. Well, going through all that, you know, I'm, I'm just so thankful to have some relief. And, you know, after that happened, one of the, you know, if you could say a good thing that happened, one of the good things that happened was after that, Things that used to bother me don't bother me anymore. It's all small potatoes. <laughs> um, and I, uh, you know, I just had such a, a better outlook on life. I, I felt, you know, protected and safe. And, and, um, and I had a really, really good outlook on life. Um, uh, enter a man by the name of Gary. This is going to be the hard part, too. Um, and it's the best part. Uh, I met a guy um, through the program. We sat in meetings uh, on and off, and um, we started talking, started having coffee, got to know each other better. And um, he had talked about uh, his relationship with his son. His son was an adult by then and in the Marines, and he had a good relationship. And I had remembered him saying, you know, talking about the teenage years when it was not so good, and he was struggling. And he now had a good relationship with that son. And, um, you know, like, like I'd always done in the program, when I see somebody that has something that I want, I want, I want to be next to them. I want to know how they got it. I want to know who they are and what their story is and what their attitude is and how they think about things and, and, and you know, how they get there. And so I started talking to him about his relationship with his son. We got to know each other better. And I so wasn't interested in, um, in getting married again or, or having another, having a romantic relationship. You know, just, I wasn't interested. Um, but something started happening. Um, you know, when you forgive, you can go on to happiness. You can be happy again. And I didn't expect that. That was the surprise for me. I had forgiven and I was starting to feel happy. Things moved on, and, and uh, we got closer and closer. And um, we eventually ended up getting married. We had so much in common. It just—it was so easy and natural. That was what was unbelievable for me, is that it was just so easy. And, um, and Gary's a man that he knows how to love people. It was so different for my son and I to live in the house with a man that was loving, considerate, 
kind, you know, put us first. I just hadn't experienced that, and it was wonderful. You know, when when our relationship first started, you know, he was kind of pushing for things to move along a little faster than what I wanted, what I thought I was ready for. But he had God in his life. That made me more willing to listen, to 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 go to to con- to try to open myself to you know being that vulnerable, open myself to to loving somebody again. Uh, he worked an Al-Anon program, worked an AA program. Was so much fun. We went boat riding. We did scouts and. Yeah, we got together with friends, and and um, you know he has a wonderful family, and uh, he adopted my son. Um, you know this is a man that hated paperwork. And you can't imagine the mounds of paperwork. And, you know how hard he worked, and how many hours he had to work for that adoption, to make that adoption happen. But he did that, and I thought, you know what's the? I was in an Al-Anon meeting one day, and somebody's talking about reality. I said, what is the reality? I thought as I sat in that meeting, what is the reality of my life today? The reality is, is that a man that would, that would throw me and my son away, you know, hurt us, that person's gone from our lives forever. And here is somebody that would go to any length. Unbelievable. Um, We had so much in common. You know, our faith, our backgrounds. When he called a refrigerator an ice box, I was like, <laughs> yeah. And um, I put him through the ultimate test. My three older sisters. <laughs> when, they, when he got their seal of approval, that's it. I knew. I knew. And... Um, you know, things weren't perfect. Everybody has issues. We both have issues. And we rocked along. And, and um, five and a half years ago, uh, new, Christmas Eve morning, um, he had a heart attack. No, uh, no prior medical issues and no problems, no warning or indicators. He'd had a little indigestion the day before, and, you know, I said, why don't you call the doctor? He called the doctor, and uh, he had a heart attack. And um, you know, me and my son's world fell apart. Uh, <clears throat> there was so much that he gave to us and so much that he did for us. Um, he was the center of our universe, no doubt. Um, and uh, he uh, he was in the hospital for almost a month before he passed away. And I can't imagine where me and my son would be today if he hadn't been in our lives. One of the things that, one of the many things that I learned from him was that a person can have their personal issues or problems, you know, whether it's a disease or or whatever it is, and they can still not let it affect the people that they love. It is possible. It's possible to do that. Um, And I think about that today, raising my son, and um, what a good example he he was for me as a parent. Um, Again, I went back to Al-Anon. I never left, but I went back to Al-Anon, and um, and I just I just took the steps. I made those steps. Worked him again. Did a little bit of surface work. You know, I've learned so much from this program, from Al-Anon. Um, 
I would go to open AA meetings and it would help to give me compassion for the alcoholic. Um, you would you would be in meetings and you would talk about things that you learned about yourself. For example, I'll never forget the time I'm in a meeting and a woman said, I had to look at why I chose and why I stayed with, you know, this person that was so needy and 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 so helpless and and I had to look at how that made me how what that why I did that what the payoff was for me that I felt you know that I was the helper and the you know superior and I knew when I heard that woman say that that part of that was something that I owned as well when you say when we're in a meeting and and, and you bear yourself you know you you say this is my character defect this is my problem and this is my solution, then it lets me decide if that's my problem and if I want to look for a solution. I learned through my experiences that there are some things that are not for Al-Anon and AA. There are some things that are for doctors and therapists and police and judges and lawyers. I learned that um, that the God of, of... I learned who the God of my understanding is. I, I didn't, I didn't have a relationship with God, but I watched you and saw what you did to get it. And I did what you did. Sometimes it worked for me, sometimes it didn't, but I didn't give up. And eventually, I came to a God of my understanding. You know, and, you know, I've heard people say, and I agree, he does have a sense of humor. There's no doubt about that. The God of my understanding doesn't judge me. He only wants to help me. The God of my understanding loves me no matter what. The God of my understanding protects me. The God of my understanding does what I can't do. The God of my understanding is working even in my life when things are the worst. He's still working. When I um, well, no. Some of the other things that I learned in Al-Anon, um, you know, was that if I get stuck, there's somebody that can help me get unstuck. And I have had periods in my life when I'm stuck. And I wanted to say that to people. You know, the double winners, I admire them. Um. You know, and if you don't have a higher power, if you don't have a God of your understanding, there's a place for you in Al-Anon and you belong there. If you don't call your higher power God, you're still welcome there. There are some people in the program that don't call their higher power God, and I have learned a lot from them. Being open is, is you know, because... Because of the program, I've been open enough that, you know, when my adolescent decided that he didn't want to go to the church that I go to, but I could be okay with that and say, you know what, he sat with me for 11 years. He wants to go someplace else. He's found God someplace else. That's okay. I'm good with that because it's more important that he find that higher power because I see the results when people don't. I get strength. I get courage. You know, when I first got here, I would look at you and say, I don't think I have that in me. I don't think I can do that. I don't think I'm that strong. But I kept coming back and I kept trying. And eventually, I found myself. I found the person that I, that I am today. I figured out who I am, what I like, what I want. And I'm good with that. I know who that person is. I learned that keeping secrets, you know, you've heard the expression, we're as sick as our secrets. That is true. That is true. Even in the program, I kept secrets from sponsors. And I can tell you, oh, and and don't think I came out with, with those secrets, you know, just one day because I decided to do that. You know, I got outed on that with that abuse and violence without my permission. I didn't have a choice. But the relief that I felt, you know, the relief that I felt, 
you know, if you're out there and you're trying to do it on your own, you don't have to. It's okay. It'll, it'll work out, you know. I love the person that I am today and my life today. I have a good life. I have a wonderful life. How long will I keep going to Al-Anon? As long as it works for me. This has been an incredible weekend for me. I've really needed to do this. It's helped me to um, to look at some things, and, and uh, I really enjoyed the, the two speakers, the one this morning and the one last night. I wanted to thank the committee for inviting me to speak. I also wanted to thank them for the beautiful basket. And um, now that my time is over, I'm looking forward to some fun. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.